Things are ramping up at the Capitol as new leadership prepares to take over the House and Senate. We look at some of the changes in this week's Capitol Report. Hello everybody and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Bartke. Things are moving at the Capitol, literally, as 67 senators make the move to new offices in different buildings. The newly elected DFL majority finds its way back to the Capitol building, while the GOP will call the state office building home for the next four years. With a change in leadership comes new committee chair assignments. The newly elected chair of the Senate Taxes Committee, Senator Rod Skoy, joins me now to talk a little bit about his post. And Senator, thanks for joining us on Capitol Report. Well, we appreciate it. More than welcome, Julie. Glad to be here. Let's begin with your new position. You're chairing what is arguably the most powerful committee in the Senate. Let's begin with describing your leadership style. Well, I've had the opportunity to serve on the Taxes Committee since I was in the Senate, so I have a pretty good feel for the committee. And my leadership style of the committee now will be very comparable to what I did as I chaired the division. I let the committee work, uh, let the members interact with each other, uh, listen closely to what they're saying, and, and try to put together, together a good bill that has consensus support as much as possible. And we will follow through with those type of skills again this year, hopefully, and see where we go. You know, newly elected Majority Leader Tom Bach has stated that the tax structure needs to be revised and move away from what he called a crisis management style of balancing the budget. So how much pressure do you feel as chair of this committee to help kind of move the state in this direction? Well, I think there is an opportunity to do some tax reform this year, and I think it is needed. Commissioner Franz has, has been traveling the state, holding town meetings around, and giving his ideas on how uh, the tax system needs to change to more reflect uh, the, the new generation that we live in. Uh, the world has changed since the last major tax reform back in the late 70s, early 70s, and we're going to revisit some of those things. Uh, not wanting to prejudge the outcome, I think we will certainly look at all of the things that uh, are on that, that the tax committee usually reviews, uh, income tax, sales tax, and of course I think we need to uh, figure out a way to lower property taxes ac across the state. It's going to take some different looks at things, but in order to bring balance into the revenue stream into the state, uh, we'll have to take a look at all of those things. And let's talk a little bit about some of those revenue streams. And, you know, as you said, you don't really want to project ahead of time what will pass and what won't, but many states are going towards on a sales tax on online purchases. The governor supports it. The DFL supports it. It's actually got some bipartisan support. Is that something you think might get taken up right away? Well, I don't think it'll get taken up right away. I think it'll be part of the tax package. I think the business community has asked for it. Uh, the large businesses Best Buy uh, uh, obviously would be interested in us passing that as long as well as a smaller business. You know, Beagle Books on Main Street in Park Rapids was here and testified a number of years ago that this was impacting their business. So we're going to look at that. Uh, that would be a relatively small provision in the tax bill. I would, I would think that the larger areas that we're going to look at is the balance between income and sales and property taxes. Trying to move the state to a more progressive tax system, uh, more reflective of having the taxes, more reflective of one's ability to pay. And the GOP leadership has stated that it will come to the table with its ideas for how to balance the budget and move Minnesota forward as well. So do you anticipate hearing legislation from the minority party? Will you take into consideration some of their ideas? Well, I think good ideas, wherever they come from, are going to get a fair hearing. And I think if you look back at my legislative career, I've always been respectful of the minority. I've served in the minority a couple times. I came in in the minority in the House. Uh, some of my best friends as House members were, were members of the other party. Uh, we worked well together on a number of pieces of legislation. I've never really cared who got credit for the idea, just as long as it, got a, it was a good idea and got to move forward. If there are good ideas, I think we're going to be moving forward on them. For example, the Amazon issue that we just talked about originally, I think Senator Ortman carried that uh, three, four years ago. So we'll see if she's interested in it again. But uh, wherever the ideas come from, not, not important to me. We're going to move forward with good ideas. And I think it'll be easier in the long run uh, to bring the public perception along if we are able to uh, act bipartisanly. Generally speaking, though, the ideologies on taxes in particular are just so polar opposite. 
what does your gut tell you? Will there be room for consensus here, or will this end up being you know, the DFL going full steam ahead? Well, the tax committee usually is one of the most partisan committees in the legislature. We have pretty strongly held uh, beliefs in, in that area, and sometimes people find it harder to move uh, off of those beliefs. But you know, I think compromise is a good thing. It's not that you're giving up on your principles, but you're finding areas of agreement where you can move forward and trying to put your differences beside. I think if everybody acts uh, in that manner and, and really truly is trying to find a better way for Minnesota to uh, raise revenue, to provide services to the citizens of the state, I think we will be able to accomplish uh, goals if, uh, if everybody wants to move in that manner. Given that this particular session is a budget year, do you feel a little more pressure on you as the chair to move things forward and keep things uh, moving at a good pace? How do you feel about this? Well, I think the tax bill generally is the last bill out of the chute, and that's because the finance divisions have to figure out what their spending numbers are going to be, and they'll get their targets, and, and then the tax committee will come in behind them. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to be working from the get-go on issues. And for, I'm sure that Senator Rest is going to be active in the tax reform division. And we're going to be doing a lot of hearings on uh, issues of importance to that area while we start out. Now, we can kind of dual track this. If there are other issues that the full committee needs to be hearing, we'll be doing that also. But I fully expect the, the reform division to be active from the day one. So, Mr. Chair, my last question for you then is, during this campaign season, essentially, the governor asked Minnesotans to elect a DFL legislature so that, you know, let the majority work with the executive branch and see what can get done. What do you think Minnesotans expect from this particular legislature? Well, I think there was a response to ending the gridlock that was occurring in the state and really has occurred for more than a decade now. And so now we have an opportunity to put our ideas forward and uh, let Minnesota's judge us on the actions that we're uh, able to accomplish. Um, I'm not going to say there's going to be unanimous agreement on all issues because that's not the way the legislative process works. And the governor's one person, he can put forward his ideas and his budget on his own. The legislature is 201, 67 senators, takes 34 to pass a bill. So we're going to be a little broader in our approach to be more inclusive, to bring more ideas into the picture. But uh, I'm looking forward to working with the governor. I think it's a unique opportunity to uh, move policy forward, and we'll hopefully have very good outcome in April. All right. With those words, Senator Rod Skoy, of course, we'll track your committee very closely this session. Thank you for jo joining us today. Yeah, thank you very much, Julie. When the 2013 legislature gets underway, a new face will preside over the Senate. It's expected that Senator Sandy Pappas will hold the gavel. She sat down with us to talk about her expectations for her new role. Senator Sandy Pappas, thanks for joining us today. It's wonderful to be here. I want to begin with what motivated you to decide that you even wanted to preside over the Senate? I've been interested actually for a long time. Um, it's not a well-known fact, but I ran 10 years ago for the presidency and did not win, so here I am again 10 years later, and this time I was successful. And what do you hope to accomplish in that Well, season? I think, first of all, um, I'd like to put a new face on the Senate. I think it's important that we have women in very prominent roles, especially smiling women. And um, I, uh, I have really three jobs that I see as mine f as, a, as the Senate president. Is First of all, I preside over the floor sessions, and I do assign the bills. And so to make sure that we go back to our tradition of having um, a fair presiding officer that follows the rules and gives everyone a chance to speak and is courteous and respectful, I think that's going to be very important. Second, um, I have <coughs> some oversight responsibilities over the administration of the whole Senate. And we have some work there. Uh, we need to enter the 21st century in terms of our human resources. Uh, we need more staff development, we need a health and wellness policy, we need to look at our salary schedules and make sure that they're in line and fair and logical and make sense. 
And then third, I'm really the face of the Senate. And so um, greeting visitors, uh, external relations. We are hosting two major conferences in the next two years, the Council of State Governments Midwestern Legislative uh, Conference in St. Paul next summer, and I'll be leading the Senate efforts for that hosting uh, responsibility. And then the following year in 2014, we're, we're uh, the site of the National Conference of State Legislators National Convention in Minneapolis, St. Paul. That's about 5,000 visitors. So I think I'm going to be busy. I'm also chairing a committee as well. And we'll get <laughs> in to my that. spare time. Absolutely. <laughs> and we will get to that. But I want to know, are you patterning your style after anybody in particular? Or is this just kind of a culmination of characteristics that come naturally to you? Well, I, um, in terms of the Senate, uh, I look to uh, former Senator Alan Speer as my role model. Um, he was also a first. He was our uh, first um, Jewish president. I would be the second. And of course, Michelle Fischbach was our first woman president, and I will be the second. But I'll be the first uh, Jewish woman president. In Minnesota, for <laughs> in sure. Minnesota. But, uh, na in Minnesota. No, okay. in Minnesota. Yeah. I want to ask you as well. Something that always seems to happen is you obviously will have to rule at some point, either in favor or against your own party. So how do you take a step away and how do you decide how you're going to rule when the time comes? Well, I make sure that everyone in my caucus and in all the senators understand the rules and read the rules so that they know if they're trying to do something that isn't in the rule book, because uh, we do have Senate rules, that I, they're going to be ruled against. and. Um, even if I have to give them a little heads up that that I'm not going to rule in their favor, it's not likely I'm going to rule in their favor. We don't know how I'm going to rule until I hear both sides and see the evidence. But I make it, need to make it clear that I'm not going to be doing partisan rulings. You just sound really excited about this this whole upcoming session. So, what are some of your expectations? Well, this is the first time in 22 years we've had what I call unity government, where uh, the governors, the House, and the Senate are all controlled by one party. So, you know, with, um, with that, with power comes much responsibility, and I think that we have an opportunity um, to show the citizens of the state of Minnesota how, um, how government can be well run and that it can be civil and we can be not in gridlock where we have shutdowns and we have um, fights and we have huge ideological differences. So I do think that <clears throat> we will be moderate and we'll be fair and uh, we might be slow in some ways that people don't want us to be slow and we might be fast in some ways that people don't want us to be fast um, depending on the priorities and of course the priorities are going to be the budget and we have um, I've been I was a budget chair for many years and we have had problems with our budget since the late 1990s when we excessively cut taxes um, looked like the economic bubble was going to last forever. It was the Clinton years and everyone was doing well. And we had Jesse Ventura as governor and there was a, a, a fight over who could cut taxes more, the Democrats, the Republicans, or Jesse Ventura, the independent governor. And we, we went too far. And so I think you're going to see some modest uh, tax increases um, in line with what the governor would like to do. And uh, so that we can at least begin to get our budget back on track. We won't. We didn't get into this problem overnight, and we won't be able to solve it overnight. But if over a course uh, over the next four years, um, we can do that. That needs to be our top priority. And as you mentioned earlier, you're also the chair of the state and local government mm -hmm. committee. So mm -hmm. what are your expectations as far as leading that committee, and how do you meld that in with president of the Senate? Well, my plan is to. Um, um, mentor leadership on my committee and um, have my committee members take responsibilities because it is really a um, quite a bit of responsibility on top of the president. So not only am I doing state, metro, local government, I'm also doing gambling and veterans affairs. Um, so it's quite a large jurisdiction. In fact, it's not even finalized the jurisdiction and so it's possible I may shift some of those things, but we'll see. If I need to take on that responsibility, I will, but I'll have, I can set up subcommittees, I can have a strong vice chair to help me in that work and good staffing. Um, so it is, it does provide uh, the oversight over all the state agency, most of them. And like I said, there'll be some issues around gambling and there always is around veterans affairs and the Met Council or townships or local government will have some issues. So it's not the most exciting committee but it's important work that we need to make sure that these 
state agencies and local agencies are well run. And as you mentioned earlier, it's the first time in 22 years that the legislature and the governor are of the same party. Do you mm -hmm. think the eyes of Minnesota of Minnesota of Minnesota are watching? What do you think their expectations are of this particular legislature? Well, I think a lot of people expect now for us to get things done because we don't have any excuses. We can't say, well, I tried to pass this, but the other party blocked it, or I tried to prevent this, but the other party insisted, whatever. Um, we should be able to get along, and we should show them that Democrats can get along and not have these um, huge ideological differences. But there are differences among us. I mean, I do expect to see some differences over mining and environmental policy, for example, or there might be differences into how fast we should move on some social issues. Um, some people think we should slow down and focus on the budget. Others say, well, we just, you know, had this big amendment fight. We maybe should move a little faster. So there will always be differences. Okay, Madam President, on those words, I want to thank you for coming on the show. And, of course, we hope to get you back during session. We thank you. It. I'd love to come back. And the biggest important thing is we do want to try to all get along. A longtime member of the Minnesota House reluctantly came out of retirement to run for the Minnesota Senate and won. And now Senator-elect Alice Johnson is excited about her new role with the legislature. She sat down with us to give us the inside perspective on returning to the Capitol. Senator Alice Johnson, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Senator, you served 14 years in the Minnesota House. What precipitated your decision to decide to run for our Senate? Well, uh... I was retired for 12 years and, and enjoyed it a lot, so it isn't that I didn't like retirement. Uh, my husband Richard Jefferson and I have had just a great 12 years. Uh, when we came home from our winter stay in Texas, which we have done for the last 12 years, um, we started looking, we were watching of course what's going on at the Capitol. When we came home, uh, there, were, there was not a, a candidate uh, that was ready to run in our district for the Senate seat for the Democrats and uh, I was appalled by that uh, and so started thinking about whether I should run again or not and really was hoping that uh, we'd find someone that would be really you know really gangbusters about it but uh, it was very people were fearful I think about taking on uh, the Republican incumbent and so after some time uh, we decided my husband and I decided that we were willing to do this and uh, I'm very happy that we did. And when you walked into the Capitol for the first time after such a lengthy hiatus, was it kind of like deja vu or was it as if you hadn't really been here? No, it was more like deja vu uh, than not feeling that I'd never been here. I, you can't forget the experience uh, that being here for 14 years and actually 13 years prior to that I served as a legislative assistant. So I've been in the Capitol for 27 years. And so it's very, I'm very uh, respectful and proud to have been here and happy to be back again and hopefully serve the people and the community well. And let's talk a little bit about what your priorities are for the legislature. You know, you were uh, chairing the K-12 Finance Committee in the House when you were with the House. And just kind of at first blush, can we, give me your impressions of how you would like to see some legislation come through to perhaps... Um, change the funding formula or reform education in general? We were talking about it a bit off camera. Well, you know, the, I was only chair of the K-12 Finance Division for two years, and that was when Governor Arnie Carlson was uh, in office. And um, so I think for me right now, I feel like I need to s take a little time and catch up on where everything's going and what proposals people are making. Uh, I definitely feel that there needs to be more stable, dependable funding for schools coming from the state. I do not like it that I see the uh, property tax funding schools in so many uh, areas. And then in other cases where communities are not uh, able to pass a referendum level, I mean, they're, they're really falling behind. Uh, and so stable funding 
from the state of Minnesota is what I'd like to see. And as you've t said, you've been through this process before. You've been a part of this entire legislative body. So even though you're new to the Minnesota Senate, do you kind of put yourself in a mentorship position? Do you consider yourself a veteran? Well, I think it's a combination. Uh, you know, going from House to Senate is definitely different. There's a different um, atmosphere and, and uh, culture in the Minnesota Senate as opposed to the Minnesota House. Uh, so that I will have to get used to and be ready to work with the way they work. And But uh, I think I feel like somewhat of a veteran in the area of education especially. Uh, it's still a very primary uh, issue for me and uh, that's why I, my number one uh, request for committees was for the Education Finance Division and then my second choice was the Education Policy um, uh, Committee. So uh, I certainly have ideas of what, uh, what I think we'll be doing but my main area will be funding because everything depends on funding. You also, when you were in the House, are remembered for your work on the pay equity plan to get female, um, female salaries in line with males, and you supported insurance coverage for breast cancer patients and two-day maternity stays for mothers and babies. So will some of these health-related and pay issues remain priorities for you as well? I'd like to think that, you know, the pay equity thing has maybe um, uh, been dealt with, but I, based on the facts, I don't think that's true. Uh, and I'd like to say that um, I was on the Spring Lake Park City Council for two years before I was elected to the Minnesota House, and that was one of the things we did at the city, uh, that I led the uh, reform for pay equity for the employees of the city of Spring Lake Park. And I was, I was very proud of that. That and the recycling program in Spring Lake Park were the two things that I really, I would like to say that I kind of accomplished uh, during those that short time that I was there. So. Uh, I, you can see I certainly uh, care a lot about um, equity issues and the, the issues of women will be a part of my um, four year term here, that's for sure. And you alluded to this a little bit, but let's go a little bit deeper and it's probably my last question for you as well. You said that you wanna sit back and learn a little bit more about you know, the issues and, and get deeper before jumping right in, but. Do you see that maybe your, the length of time it's going to take you to get up to speed, do you think that might be shorter compared to some of the other freshmen? And how soon do you anticipate dig diving right in? Oh, I, I'm going to be diving right in right away. Um, I know I will be, and people will be expecting me to. And um, I was appointed vice chair of the education finance division under Chuck uh, Weger. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's because of my experience in the House and it will also mean that I will have additional responsibilities or adi additional expectations for me uh, because of my experience uh, in the 14 years I was here. You just mentioned expectations. What expectations do you have for the session? Uh, the, the primary, besides education, uh, the primary um, expectation that I have would be that we start working together better. And I'd really, I'm very sincere about that. I really want to be able to listen to what uh, the Republicans uh, have to say, what they want to offer, what they would like to see happen, and hopefully be able to find a common ground. Uh, that's been, my whole campaign was really based on that, more so than even than education issues. Uh, it was the working together. That's what the people of Blaine, Spring Lake Park, and Coon Rapids have said very clearly. They want us to work together and quit the bickering. Senator, you did serve 22 years ago when the governor and the legislature were of the same party. It's a repeat now and it's been that long. So what kind of experience and expectations and um, advice can you give to some of the new members since it has been so long since everybody has been of the same party in these leadership positions? Well, what, I've, uh, what I remember and, and think about is that uh, during that time when it was all Democrat, the governor's office, the House and the Senate, uh, that we were, there was more um, debate amongst the House and the Senate, or the House and the governor. And uh, so, you know, the Democrats were kind of doing a little more of the debating, that's what I remember, than, rather than just the uh, Republicans and the Democrats. Uh, I, I don't like to use the word fighting, but because it's not meant to be a negative thing, but uh, but uh, 
uh, bringing forward their ideas together. So I, I think what, what I'd say to the, um, the people who have never been uh, in this situation, that uh, don't expect it to go all s real, terribly smoothly all the time, that there will be plenty of disagreement in, even amongst the Democrats. Okay. <clears throat> well, welcome to the Minnesota Senate. We appreciate your time, Senator Johnson, and we look forward to interviewing you in the future. I look forward to serving. Thank you. A hundred and fifty years ago, our country was in the midst of the Civil War. We continue our series looking at some of the artifacts on display here at the Capitol. In a corridor just outside of the State Capitol Rotunda is one of Minnesota's most important artifacts from the Civil War, and that's the flagstaff that was used by the first Minnesota at Gettysburg. You have to remember they were there for two days of the fighting of that three-day battle. At the second day of that uh, battle, they made their famous charge where they lost about 80 percent of their men. And on the third day, they were pretty much centered right in the middle of where Pickett's Charge took place. And that's where this flagstaff really became an important artifact or an important part of that story of Gettysburg. As the Confederates were advancing towards Cemetery Ridge, the first Minnesota men were firing and there was uh, uh, the battle going on and the, the lines of Confederates were kind of meandering and working their way up to the top of that ridge. And the color bearer for the first Minnesota waving the flag was hit in the hand by a bullet, and that also splintered the flagstaff. So when that dropped, another soldier from the first Minnesota, uh, Henry O'Brien, picked up that flag and started running toward the con advancing Confederates. Well, the flag was kind of flimsy, so he broke off the bottom part of that flagstaff, flung that aside, and then advanced toward the enemy. Well, as the other men from the first Minnesota that saw that happening, they charged after their new color bearer as he was advancing into the Confederate lines. Well, by the end of that battle, the Confederates, of course, had retreated. The Minnesota had their flagstaff, but only half of that. And one of the important parts of that battle was there was a battle flag from the 20th Virginia that was captured by another Minnesota soldier. And uh, the bottom half, half of that flagstaff was removed from that Virginia flagstaff and then spliced to this flagstaff so you have one long flagpole once again to carry that regimental flag or that national color in this instance. And even at that time when they, after they had wrapped a, a knapsack, a strap around the splice and also put some nails in there, I don't, I don't think many of the soldiers uh, forgot or saw the importance of the symbolism this now created because now we have a northern half of a flagstaff and the southern half of a flagstaff joined together. So the intent was someday we will be a union once again. It's now easier to stay in touch with activity at the state capitol. Senate Media Services is on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Find the links on our homepage. So follow us and follow the Senate. And that concludes this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching.